what do you believe right now that's making you feel this way? And when you analyse it, you realise how irrational you can be at times. Every single one of our major customers and minor customers all shut their doors overnight. It's not sales per se, but the outcome of it is because people get to know you, they get to see you. Making those efficiencies to maximise service profits as well as just product profits. When you lose the enthusiasm, that's the point to move on. Scaling up a business isn't easy. If it were, we wouldn't have less than 4% of businesses scaling beyond 10 employees or around a million pound turnover level and less than 1% beyond 50 employees. But the contribution that we make as owner managers to our economies is immense and should never be underestimated. Yet it can be a tough gig for all of us at times. And only other business owners truly understand the challenges that we face. And through Scale Up Radio, we aim to help make things a little easier. We interview guests who have been where you are now and may have faced some of the challenges that you are facing. And they offer their thoughts and advice on what has worked for them as well as what didn't. And we've also combined many of the lessons from these interviews and also through working with hundreds of owner managers over the last 10 years or so into a practical scale-up handbook that we've called the Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System, or ESIS. And it's for owner managers like you and me as we navigate our own scale-up journey. And you can order a copy through your favorite online book retailer or by going to all the W's, esisgroup.co.uk www.esusgroup.co.uk Welcome to Scale Up Radio, the podcast that brings you inspiring conversations with industry experts and successful entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Kevin Brent, and today we've got a really captivating episode with Jonathan Guy, the founder and managing director of Aqueous Digital. And in this episode, Jonathan shares his extensive knowledge and his experience in the world of search engine optimization or SEO. And we explore Jonathan's journey from his early days at Yellow Pages to founding Aqueous Digital, his approaches to delegation and trusting employees as the business grows, and the importance, the real importance of empowering team members. Stay tuned as Jonathan reveals his three rules of Google, shares his recommended resources for business owners and discusses his upcoming book, Search Never Sleeps. Let's dive right into the conversation with Jonathan Guy, right here on Scale Up Radio. Welcome to another episode of Scale Up Radio. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Jonathan Guy, who is the founder and managing director of Aquis Digital. So Jonathan, welcome to uh, Scale Up Radio. Thank you, Kevin. You're very, very welcome. And listen, I'm delighted to be here. I have been looking forward to this for such a long time. It's been in my diary. So, so yes, Good. thank you for having me on the show. So tell us about Aqueous Digital. What it, what's it all about? Well, Aqueous Digital is essentially a digital marketing agency, but there's thousands of those out there, as, yep. as I'm sure you're aware. But we specialize, therefore, in, in search engine optimization um, and uh, reputation management for high and ultra high net worth individuals. Okay. So not necessarily businesses, but more for the high net worth individuals then? The reputation management part is very yeah. personal, yes, but the SEO is all about business. It's only for businesses, really. Okay. So typically then, who would your typical business be as an ideal client? Uh, ideal customers for us are, are people who um, have invested in marketing, who have grown to a certain size. Normally, they turn over anybody, anywhere between one and 50 million. Um, they normally have 10 or more staff, and they're spending really as a part of a marketing mix rather than just doing SEO as, as the whole thing, if you like, for the business. Yeah. Um, and, and these are the kind of businesses that we get involved with because – they've realized that organic search is so important these days. Otherwise, you're literally paying through the nose for everything. So it's very much about how we help them get the most of that, of that organic search and how we can grow the volumes of what they're going to be uh, receiving from their website uh, over a period of time. And can you give us a feel for the kind of businesses that maybe you've worked with and that, that, that you've had some great success with? 
Yeah. So we've got a whole range at the moment. At the moment, we've got a solicitor we're working with. It's actually a group of practices based in the East Midlands. Fabulous customer. Um, and we've been really, really successful with the content strategy we put together for them. So much so that we, we won a European content award just a few weeks ago for that particular work. Um, we've also been working with a, a range of other customers, like there's an insolvency practitioner we've been working with quite closely, um, and, and several other businesses, really most business types that, that have grown to a certain point in time that they need somebody to help them move forward a bit further. Great. And um, when you talk about the reputation management side of things, what kind of things are we talking about about there? Well, reputation management is is one of those interesting ones because the people we get involved in normally find that that our, their online profile is quite messy because people are saying bad things about them for whatever reason. Some yeah. of it's justified, some of it's not. Um, what we usually do is work closely with uh, solicitors, which, which will inevitably be involved already, who will try and remove legally everything that they can remove legally. Uh, with their press and PR teams who are looking to uh, create the right narrative for those individuals. Um, and then we come in as the third part of that, which is to say, well, once the, the press and PR teams have done their piece, how can we ensure that the right stuff appears at the top of Google and the stuff they don't want to see moves further down? And of course, specialist knowledge of search engine optimization is essential for that. Yeah, very interesting. And you know, that sounds like there may be fewer people doing that aspect versus the the SEO. Is, is that fair? Absolutely, yes. There's only a handful of, of other firms I know of who specifically do that that kind of work. Um, and we tend to work very much on referral and recommendation in that space, uh, working cl closely with uh, several solicitor firms, for example, who, who will uh, email us and say, listen, we have a client who might need your help. Could you have a look, please? Now, quite often we have to go back and say, well, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, if your client's done something really bad and they're appearing for that really bad thing, no amount of work we do is going to shift that. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, if there's stuff there which really is um, uncharitable or um, something that people have just taken a dislike to them for whatever reason, or someone, you know, trolls have got a grudge, then we yeah. can help. We can move in and deal, deal with that. Yeah, so you can you can alter the bias, I guess, rather than actually change the facts. Yeah, I mean, we, we can't remove anything that people have said, um, no. but what we can do is make sure that what they want people to see appears on page one rather than the the stuff they don't want to see which currently is there that makes yeah. sense great and what's the rough split of your business then between those two two oh, men 90 percent of our work really is search engine optimization 10 yeah. percent is the reputation management work at this moment in time although it is growing it'll, it'll probably end up near 20 percent of our uh, entire business at the end of this financial year okay and how do you so how do you differentiate yourself from the seo companies then when we're, when you're talking pure seo rather than the reputation management well the, the seo as you as you say it's, it's very hard to differentiate yeah. in the crowded yeah. marketplace um although I, i've got to say our marketing director christian's doing a fabulous job at the moment we're working very closely with a brand consultancy um, and they've done some superb work for us in terms of branding, positioning and the messaging that we're sending out to people. And really, the, the work that they've done with us has all revolved around them understanding what we do as a business um, and getting a real feel, getting under the skin of the business. So much so that we're actually doing SEO for them now okay. um, for the deal, so they can actually feel what it is that we do. Um, and the essence behind what we do has come down to you know, a single strap line, which is SEO done right. Okay, um, that's got a whole load of other facets about it, obviously. But within that, we've got the fact that we tend to deal in plain English. We don't go for jargon very often because most customers aren't interested in jargon. Um, and and really under, underpinning all of that is part of the philosophy of the business, which is we're here to help. That's it. Okay, and and you've got a number of people in the business, and you bring out their different personalities, I think, as well, don't you, in the way that you talk to your clients. Uh, yes, you know, I, I think the whole idea behind uh, behind the business is we want to be as transparent as we can with the work that we do. Um, and, and each of the individuals that we've got in the business is visible on the website and our customers can talk to them. If, if they need specialist marketing advice, for example, they can talk to our marketing director. If they need specialist sales advice, we can get them to talk to our sales director. We, we'll just help them because they're our customers. 
yeah and i think it's more than that though because you you bring out some of their hobbies and their the the, the the things that make them people rather than just employees don't you you've seen our bloopers reel haven't you <laughs> <laughs> yes i know you collect stamps <laughs> yeah, thank you yes that's it. for those of you who are on the podcast you won't see it but but on screen kevin can see my, my stamp collection in the background um but but yeah i mean we, we try to make it uh personal um, and for, we want our customers to understand that we're dealing with real people. We're not some faceless organization who's just going to uh, give us your money every single month and we'll churn out a report when we feel like it. Uh, th these are real people with you know, real lives, real hobbies and a real interest in both search engine optimization and getting great results for their customers. I mean, that's that's the beauty. We, we let them own the customers. Um, and, and because of that, that, they take full ownership of what goes on and they work it brilliantly. Great. And I might come back to that in a bit, because that's often one of the challenges of growing and scaling a business is finding a way to empower the team um, that they do feel that sense of ownership and, and accountability for their for their particular areas. So it might, might come back a little bit more more to that. Can you can you give us a feel of the size of the business, maybe in terms of number of people or or clients? Yeah. So in, in terms of the well, in terms of both, we're, we're about 100 clients at the moment or customers, should I say, and um, about 26 staff with another eight contractors that we use on an ongoing basis. So, so yeah, it's grown to a fair size these days. Yeah, and and in terms of how the business model works, I mean, I understand a little bit about the, the SEO side of things, but is, is it a is it everybody, everybody on retainers or is it a different, you pay on results? How do you how do you do things? Yeah, we, we decided really very close to the start that what we wanted to do was to create a recurring revenue model. Yeah. And it's kind of ex exponential when you do that. So it takes quite a long time to build that up. It really does. And it's uh, we've been going for 12 years now. Um, but we reckon we'll double turnover in two years now because of the amount of recurring revenue that we've actually got going through the business. So, so on, that, on that basis, the whole idea was to get more and more customers paying us on a monthly basis for retained services. Um, and then to keep them as long as we possibly can. And we've managed to do that quite successfully. Great. And do you do you track things like retention rates and how much it costs you to acquire your customers? Do you look we track everything? Absolutely yeah. everything. If you can't measure it, you can't change yeah. it. So yeah. yeah, we track absolutely everything. Any marketing metric metric you could think of, any financial metric, we, we've got them all there. We don't look at all of them all the time, but there are a key few that we do focus on. So yes, retention is one average value of customer is another uh, yep. lifetime value is something that's really important to us yeah so you're essentially calculating that lifetime value no doubt to how much it's cost you to acquire each customer as well and you're looking at that that ratio yeah customer acquisition costs are an interesting one because w with a diverse marketing mix sometimes it can be hard to pin down mm. how does actually really cost you to get a customer, particularly as as most of your um, uh, most of your um, guests on the on the podcast will say, well, referral referral and recommendation are our best source. Well, that's great, but how much does that actually cost you? Yeah, it's a real difficult question to answer because you know the answer is it's cost me five years in a network group <laughs> and as many as I can have, and then suddenly one of these people has turned around and said, well, I've known you for long enough. Do you do you think you could give me a quote? So. What cost do you put on that? Yeah, very, very difficult. Is that something you can help your customers with, though, through the SEO, is 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 helping them to work out what the acquisition cost was, essentially? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly from an online point of view, because what we're looking to try and do here is to ramp up the number of people visiting their website in the first instance. If you've then got the on-page experience correct, the right marketing message on your on your website, that should then convert to leads. Leads then should convert to customers. And if it breaks down anywhere down the chain there, we can actually dive in and have a look and see what's going wrong and maybe tweak something to help them put it right. But the, the key metric for us is, are they making money from the activity they do with us? And the surest way of doing that is to just drive more traffic, which is relevant and, and stuff that they actually want as a business to their website. Okay, great. So what are some of the key challenges that you face in in the seo world in, in your in your world what's <laughs> every day's a challenge <laughs> we're, we're, we're business owners so yeah <laughs> I mean, that's what we love isn't it <laughs> where, where do i start start at the top of the government or no 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 let's not yeah. go there i, I mean certainly on a, on a professional level when, when i started in this industry 
uh, which was, well, 2011, Aqueous Digital started. Um, we, we were off to the races within a couple of months, but within six months of setting up, Google introduced its first Penguin update, which of course was the big update that upset all the link building firms and destroyed huge amounts of equity out there in the yeah. uh, in the SEM field. So uh, so yeah, we've kind of got used to the fact that it changes, everything changes on an ongoing basis. And from there, I've developed my three rules of Google, um, okay. which, which have held together in the last twelve years. And in fact, so much so they've just been codified, and they're in a book that's coming out hopefully at the end of this month, if we can get oh. the top setter to, to finish it on time. Brilliant. So uh, what are those three rules of Google? <laughs> well, 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 the three rules are fairly straightforward. The rule number one is Google is just a machine. Okay. Now that applies to any search engine, obviously, but it, it's important to remember it's a very, very clever machine and it's getting cleverer every single day now with artificial intelligence, language learning models, and so on and so forth. But it's still just a machine and you must never forget that when you're you're actually putting together your website and your SEO approach. Uh, rule number two is nothing, but nothing beats great content. And the reason for that is fairly straightforward. We ask Google billions of questions every single day, and it has to find the right answers in under half a second. And it can only do that if it actually has the right answer somewhere in its database. So creating the right answers in the first place makes sense. So if you create right answers, and let Google crawl your website and take hold of them, then, then it's got the answer it needs, which means it's likely to serve you higher in the search results because you're giving the answer that its customers and ultimately your customers want. Yeah. And then the third rule, I had to tweak this in, in about 2018, but only by one bit, which is it's one page, one keyword or phrase. And I had to add all phrase on because it used to just be about keywords. But Google changed. So, so when it now talks about keywords, it doesn't. It talks about search phrases because it right. wants to, to focus not on a specific keyword, but on what the searcher's intent is. What are they looking yeah. for? And, and how do we optimize around that? And that's it. Those are the three rules. Really straightforward. But everything we do then is actually built on this system. Um, and it's because it's rooted in marketing, which is my background, rather mm -hmm. than in tech, which I know a lot of guys in this kind of industry are actually very, very good on the tech. Great. OK, so that sounds like some of the things we need to think about. What else do we need to think about if, if we're if we're a business owner and we have struggled with SEO, we might have um gone down the path with a different agency or something and not quite got the results that we wanted or we dabbled at it ourselves um you know other than coming to aqueous obviously that's the thing we really should do but what 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 should we be thinking about uh, well it very much depends on, on where you are in your business how big the business is and how much resource you've got so yes if you're coming to us then you know uh, our fees are, are reasonable should i say um, but they do start at a, at a threshold which chops out a very very large number of very small micro businesses because yeah. they simply haven't got the finance for that in which case it's about self-help and there's so much self-help out there there's youtube videos there's podcasts there's books there's um, articles that there's so much material out there sometimes it's very confusing so what i've done in in the book um, is i've actually rather than tell people how to do seo because that's already there I, i've tried to explain why you should do it and, and okay. what's important. So I think the key thing is if you're looking for help, what you need to understand is why is that important? Why should I do that particular bit of SEO? Um, and how can I do it? And I point people to the resources that are already online. Uh, because you know, let's face it, I'm printing a book, so it's going to be out of date the second it comes off the presses, right? Mm. But the online resources are constantly updated. And yeah. so I point people to where to go to get good, high quality professional advice. And 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 sounds like what you're doing within the book then is is helping us to think in the right way to understand understand it so that we can then look for the right answer which might change but the thinking uh, doesn't necessarily change. Absolutely, and 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 the one thing that I always sort of remind people is that no matter how much you're enthralled to Google for all its dominance in the search market in the UK, Google doesn't have any pockets. It never buys anything that you're selling the customers that are using it do so you've got to be talking to them not to google 
The trick about Google is making sure that when you are talking to your customers, you've structured stuff in such a way that the machine also understands because you're relying on that machine to show it to your prospective customers. And it can only do that if it knows what you're trying to do. Yeah. So it's about structure to make sure your customers can actually come to you. Great. Brilliant. So let's go back to what got you started then. You mentioned you were in marketing be before. What what made you set up the business in, in 2011? And when we were off air, I think you said that actually you registered the company quite a long time before that. So I, I did, several years before. And, and that's because at the time um, I was working for Yellow Pages. Um, we all remember Yellow Pages. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Hartley and so on and let, so forth. Let your, let your fingers do the walking. Correct. Yeah, that's exactly. It. And what a great company to work for. Let me say that was brilliant. I loved my time there. And I was there for 24 years in total. Um, and during that time, I was in sales, I was in marketing, I went back into sales again, I did several stints doing several jobs. They were a fabulous company, they paid for me to do an MBA, which was even really kind of them. That was mm -hmm. lovely. They also paid for me to do my marketing qualification. So I became a chartered marketer in 2000 and have remained so ever since. That's nearly a quarter of a century coming up now. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, they were, they were really good to work for. Um, but in 2008, they called us to a, a meeting and they showed us the strategy for Yale.com. And, and I kind of scratched my head and thought, that's not really going to work. Um, and sure enough, two years later, we were told that there was a round of redundancies coming. So... I already had it in my head that I wanted to set up my own business and I wanted to grow my own business. I wanted to do something and leave a legacy. Um, and so by, by that combination of those two things coming together, I actually took voluntary redundancy in 2010 um, and then did a bit of gardening leave, which you have to, a bit of consulting, which was great. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And then Aqueous came into being uh, with me and one other guy in a small room, which was you know, 10 foot by 10 foot and two computers. That was it. So right. yes, that was a journey to that point in time. And um, um, what was the, you know, what was what was the purpose that you started out with? If you like, what was the reason you decided to set up a digital agency? Yeah, well, the prior seven years, I'd actually been in one of the senior sales positions in in Yellow Pages. So I was going, I was going out to see customers who were spending you know, a quarter of a million pounds, for example, in, in print advertising. And what I decided and what, I, what it sort of came down to was the bit I enjoyed was helping people. I really enjoyed helping businesses make money. But one of the firms I work with, he, he's gone on to become a multimillionaire. Right. He's lovely. He's a great guy. He's got places in Barbados now. He hasn't invited me out yet, but I'm waiting. <laughs> well, if he's, if he's listening, he knows what he needs to do then. I'll send him the link. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I realized that I wanted to help people, but increasingly, print wasn't helping them in the way that they wanted so logically a digital agency would be the right way to go now i'm not very arty or creative so i looked at what else could be a help and lots of the customers at that time were talking to me about search engine optimization and how much they were spending on it that turned my attention to it and then i started investigating and i spent a couple of years from 2008 onwards digging into it to find out more about search engine optimization and what it was why it was important um, and, and why everyone was now talking about it and why businesses were spending so much money in that it's a fascinating journey that piece okay so tell, tell, us, more, tell us a bit more about that then well the, the, the journey itself was great because the, the more i dived into it the more i understood about it the more i realized lots of people were cheating <laughs> right and, and that became that became really the start of the company because uh, I've I've always played with a straight bat. I've, I've never wanted to cheat at any point and, and yeah. I wasn't going to. And so when we set the firm up, I made it quite clear that we were actually going to do it, what they call the white hat way rather okay. than the black hat. Yeah. Uh, as in, you know, going around the back of the houses and, and cheating the, the system. Um, and, and because we started off on a white hat approach, um, when Google started doing the updates in 2011 and 2012 about links and content, um, mm. we already ahead of the curve because yep. we've really done things the right way so customers who came with us weren't penalized and in fact in 2012-13 i picked up quite a bit of work from companies who'd been hit by penalties which then needed cleaning up um, mm -hmm. and because i understood what they had done wrong i was able to go in and reverse engineer some of it and, and help customers out which was great so i was back to helping people again 
Great. So you mentioned one of the sort of inflection points, the Mars injuries around that and around the penguin penguin update. You know, yeah. what 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 were some of the other kind of milestones along your along your journey? Um, there, there was there was a major milestone um, about five years in when when I, I confess I had a bit of a wobble um, because the, the original guy who'd come with me he'd left after nine months. I'd still managed to grow the team though. We'd managed to survive and, and move on. And was he a was he a partner or was he an employee? He was an employee, um, yeah. but he was a brilliant SEO brain, the best I've ever found. Um, yeah. And to to this day, you know, he he's still some of the stuff he taught me. I, I still rely on today because it was it was so advanced in some respects. Um, but about five years in, uh, the guy who was leading our SEO team at that time decided to throw the towel in. Uh, and I came home to my wife and I said, look, he's, he's jacked it in. Should I, should I carry on? You know, yeah. <laughs> you get one of those existential moments. You just yeah. think, why am I doing this? Cause I'm not, I'm not enjoying this because right. I was trying to manage a team of about six people and I really wasn't enjoying it. Um, and my wife being my wife said, absolutely not. Um, I'm coming in with you tomorrow. We'll sort this out. Okay. <laughs> she's a brilliant manager. She's brilliant. Um, and so she came in and she did, and she, she started putting things right. And, and this was one of the big lessons, which I'll mention now, but we'll, yeah. we can reprise later, which is you need to keep an eye on your staff and make sure you're looking after them. I thought I was looking after them by being their mate, but I wasn't. I wasn't giving them targets. I wasn't giving them appraisals. We weren't having formal one-to-ones. They didn't have development plans in place. All the basic stuff, yeah. which, frankly, I didn't have time for because I'm building a business, running a business, doing the SEO as well. I was on the tools still. You just don't, don't have time for it. And I kind of expected that they were self-sufficient. They weren't. Uh, and because of that, they were dissatisfied. So right. it came in and immediately changed the company culture. Um, and it's been brilliant. So fast forward another seven years. Um, she's now our chief commercial officer. And and the culture we have grown is so good that, you know, staff satisfaction. We actually asked them on the staff survey recently, staff satisfaction and job security, 100%. Brilliant. 100%. Wow. So I've ne never seen it like that before. But yeah. Now that's with a team of 26. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Very good. So that might be worth exploring a little bit because you you hinted early on that um, you've got a team that feel that they own uh, various, the, the, the responsibility for their their areas, you know, and they've got that full engagement with it. And I'm guessing that's come through with that culture and 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 the way that you're running things. So there's probably quite a lot of us out here that are thinking, yeah, I'm I, I I'm at that sort of stage. I've got. You know, I've got six, six or so, so people. Um, I've got plenty, of, plenty of clients, maybe. Um, but I'm working all hours under the under the under the sun, and and I'm probably not earning as much as I thought I might earn as well. It sounds like that's where you were at that at that at that point. Yeah, absolutely. I was I was earning a pittance at the time because I was pouring all the money back into the business. Yeah. Uh, and ironically, uh, one of the next steps was to earn even less because we spent on recruitment. We actually recruited better people and i know you hear this all the time you surround yourself with people who are better yeah. than you yeah. honestly it's the best thing to do um and even if they they cost more we, we actually took on one employee who we couldn't afford literally couldn't afford right. um but they they've paid us back so well, time and time and time again to the point they're now a sales director so, <laughs> and so what gave you what gave you the confidence to to do that i mean your wife's come in and she's given you a bit of a kicking by the sounds of it yeah. but, <laughs> but but you know what what gave you the confidence to to employ somebody that you couldn't afford um it's a leap of faith right it's an absolute leap of faith so i'm on various peer groups and, and network groups and so on and one of the peer groups i belong to um the chaps around the table at one point and ladies looked to me and said you must be mad. Each month we'd meet and we'd talk to them about the challenges we're facing. And, and and they used to think I was crazy. And and their advice to me as a, as a non-executive board was, no, don't do that. Don't don't spend all that money. Don't, you know, don't go out on a limb there and do that. Um, and I, I'm afraid I rather ignored them. Um, and, I, and I had to put my faith in uh, people and and our, our values. And our first value is trust. Yep. And, and my view was, if you can't trust people, you're not going to move forward. And as the owner of, a, of any business, as you're growing, you are going to have to trust people. You're going to have to learn and teach yourself 
to trust people. Now, I don't mean treat uh, anybody, you know, obviously you're going to have to be careful and selective with your recruitment. You're going to have to make sure you enjoy working with these people. But to move your business forward, they have to be trusted because, trust me, you can't do all of the jobs that you start off doing as the firm grows. Yeah. Because as, as I've said earlier, I couldn't do HR. I was pretty poor at people management as well. Mm. I was great at the finance. I could do that. I was great at the SEO. I was doing that. I was even okay at the sales just because I was bringing all those in as well. But as we grew, it became self-evident that I could not continue to do all those jobs. Um, and the hardest one, which only happened two years ago, was I had to hand over the finance to our assistant financial controller, um, which just happens to be uh, our son. Oh. He's joined us in the business. So I've got a son and a daughter in the business, which is great. So it's a bit of a family firm. Um, and I, I think the, the key thing is my wife said to me at the, at the time, two years ago, she said, um, you're going to find this next bit very, very hard. She says, because I'm almost going to make you redundant within your own firm. And I'd read it in the entrepreneurial books. I'd seen yeah. it in various lectures and so on. And, you know, the, all the advice from people, make yourself redundant in your own firm. You know, it's the only way to do it. Um, it, it, it's true. It's one of the it's one of the top tips, and it's the hardest one to do because Absolutely. God, you want to meddle. I tell you, you yeah. so want to get back in and get on the tools and do the work yourself. Um, but if you can resist, if you can hold back, and then maybe do training sessions with these people instead of actually physically doing the job, and help and coach them and spend your time doing that, they'll come on leaps and bounds. They'll engage more with you and with the business and with your customers they'll trust you more you'll trust them more the whole thing starts to grow and it's brilliant yeah um but it is it is a difficult trans transition as, you, as you've said and, and you've articulated um something that i think is quite quite interesting because you talked about you know you've got your finger in a lot of the pies you were doing a lot of the a, a lot of those things and the first step was to to find a way to delegate or to find somebody else to to do those things but those are the things that you probably shouldn't have been doing if you if, if you like because you're better off somewhere else yeah exactly but then at some point you're still holding on to some of the things that actually you're you're, you're really good at and possibly even the best at in the in, in the business but at some point you've got to let that go and it might and it sounds like finance might have been that one or 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 some, something else but yeah, you're right. I mean, the finance bit now, uh, our son actually knows more about it than I do, which is great. So I, I can trust him with that one. I can walk away from that. Um, the sales, I still sell. Um, I, inadvertently, I find myself because people come to me and say, look, I've seen you on this or I've heard you on that or, you know, we've known you for years. Can you help? And I just can't resist it. Um, I, I've been told I should be saying to people, we can help you. I'll put you in touch with our sales director who will get one of our people to do it. Yeah. I just can't help myself and, <laughs> and I find myself sitting there doing audits on, on the computer and, and sending proposals to customers and going, wow, that, you know, this, this would be great. And, you know, wandering through the door with a large order. There's nothing quite like it, obviously. Um, but I need to stop doing that because it, it means I'm not doing what I should be doing, which is running the business. Yeah. It's the thing. It takes time away from all the other stuff, all the, the big bits that will add value, the strategy and so on. That, that's yeah. where the value starts to get added now. Yeah, and and certainly going from the sort of stage you're at to sort of fifty employees, if that's where you where, where you're going. One of the challenges we hear a lot there is what exactly what you've described is that people still come to the owner, so they bypass the sales director or or whichever director because they maybe they're a long-standing customer, um, and it's very difficult again to stop yourself meddling if you like, and to be able to push it push it push it back. I think once you get past a certain level, you become a professional meddler in your own business. Yeah. And it pays to meddle because what you do is you dip into certain areas. Right. So I'll go and sit with the guys and uh, occasionally say, so what's going on with this customer? Where are you up yeah. to? What are your challenges? How are you going to solve that? Who are you talking to about it? Have you considered this? What about, yeah, so we, we, we go down that sort yeah. of route with them. Um, and in each department, I, I'm I'm allowed to go and ask the questions. Although my, my wife does kind of ring fence me away from some of this stuff sometimes. God bless her, she's right because I shouldn't be meddling as much as I am. Um, but that's where you find yourself. Um, and then after a while, you realise actually there are bigger things you should be doing as a business yeah. owner. So, so yeah, it's good to be able to trust people and let them get on with the job you actually pay them to do. 
yeah and I, i've got some specific questions on that i want to come back to again and it's it's also i think been referred to sometimes as that transition from being the hero of the business to being the guide so in the early days you have to be the hero you have to be the one that says the champions everything and this is how we're going to do it and others follow you um but you've got to fight if you want to get beyond a certain level you've got to find a way that you transition to being the guide and other people become the heroes for their at least for their areas within the business absolutely and and you have to go through a mental change which actually says you're not the focus of attention anymore yeah it's your business um and it's not your efforts that's driving this forward it's everybody else and they're the ones that need the recognition and they're the ones that need the reward and they're the ones that need the pat on the back and so as an entrepreneur as somebody who grows a business you, you can actually find yourself in quite a lonely place on occasions and several friends of mine have found themselves there where the business is going great guns but they they feel worthless because no one's telling them how good a job they're doing yeah. and it's very well seeing you know the, the profit going up and the balance sheet improving and all the rest of it but no one's actually putting an arm around their shoulder and saying you did a really good thing there um and so it's hard individually and personally for people sometimes to get past that little bit um luckily i've got to a stage in life where i, I really don't mind anymore and, and i honestly know it's not my efforts that's driving this forward it's everybody else in in the team who's doing this now so they're the ones who are the heroes in our business and they're the ones who make a difference on a daily basis for all our customers so so yeah, i'm i'm very very happy to give them all the credit at this moment in time great so i want to go back to that time when you got the sort of six employees or so and your wife came into the business um Take us through some of the other things. So, so you know, I know you, you, you mentioned very quickly that you started setting targets and appraisals, one-to-ones, all of, those, all of those things. What about, um, you know, you, you've made the decision to, to hire somebody who's become your, your sales director. Did you do anything around the types of customers that you'd, that, that, that you'd got? Did you do anything around pricing at that time as well to facilitate that change? Not, not at that time, no. Um, although those things were to come later on. I think one of the other big things that she did was she brought in an office manager. Um, and that was that was essential. And, and they became an office manager HR person, which was great. And then sort of we grew and evolved from there. And at, at key points through the, the journey, we, we've added in key members of staff wherever we can, usually ahead of expectation. So normally when we can't afford it, uh, normally <laughs> Normally, when we haven't got enough money for these people, they turn up on your doorstep and they're really good. And you just think, I can't, I can't waste good. I'm not going to let that person go. So, so we've ended up with, with uh, an office manager who we then morphed, and there's another uh, lady came in as, as the office manager who then became our customer relationship manager, who's now our operations director. So she was brilliant, and Paula has actually moved the, the firm forward again, another step on from where we were. Uh, in sales, we had uh, Ian came in as our sales man or sales manager, but then he's become our sales director and he runs the sales team now. Um, we've got marketing. We employed Christian, our marketing manager, in April 2020. Great, really good timing. Um, everyone had locked down in March, working from home, and this brand new starter comes into our business and he doesn't meet anybody at all for the first six months. That was that was a challenge. Um, yeah. Again, he's brilliant. He's done some superb work with us. He's now a marketing director. So, so trusting these people and putting your key players in place whenever you can will help facilitate the growth of the business. Because if they're that good as people that you want to employ them, they should be that good to help your business move forward. And one of the things that I'm sure gives you the confidence to do that is the stability you've created through the fact that probably 100% or certainly 90 plus percent or something of your income is recurring revenue. Absolutely. And that is the beauty of any recurring revenue model, which is every, every month. And the other thing, by the way, is we take it in advance on direct debit wherever we possibly can. So you're right. Yeah. It's about 80% of our revenues. Um, and that every single month, as you, as you turn the lights on and turn the key in the door for, for day one, you know you've got a chunk of your money arriving in to pay all the bills. So you know you can pay the bill. So then it's about how much you can do within that month, how much you can move your customers forward, and then how many more customers you can take on before you need to add an extra head into your business. Right. So you've, you've given us a little hint already. So with the 26 that you've got now, 26 people, how's, how's that, how is the business structured organisationally? How, how have you done that? 
it's a pretty flat structure. I mean, from a tech point of view, we've got people based in, in remote locations as well as in the office. And, and we do a hybrid working now ever since lockdown, we've been able to, to do that. Uh, oddly enough, my wife saw it coming. She sent everybody home the week before lockdown to work on their laptops to make sure that it all worked. Mm. Um, your years. wife your wife sounds like a very wise person yeah she she is but you know she, she, she's getting all the credit here and rightly so um <laughs> and and even before that prior to uh i think it was about 2019 we decided we would a year ahead of schedule because we'd already budgeted for it we put in a, a full crm system if we hadn't done that early we would never have been able to to manage through through what was essentially you know a two-year shutdown for the whole of the country um, because we put the CRM in, we were able to operate on a worldwide basis with staff wherever and wherever and whenever. Um, and we've got a, a lovely lady in Ukraine at the moment who's working for us. She was uh, she was put out of a job by the invasion, so she's now part of our team. We've got our, one of our um, senior SEO people is in India at the moment, yep. so she's working from there for us. And then we've got throughout the UK, we've got different people in different locations. As well as a core uh, here in the northwest uh, of England, who, who do come in and out of the office on a fairly regular basis. So, so yeah, so the structure we've got is quite flat, uh, deliberately so. We don't want a massive hierarchical structure because it just gets messy. If it's a flat structure, we can give people the the room they need to grow within their roles, and that will give them the promotion that they look for. That will give them the increased salary they're looking for. We can facilitate that. It doesn't necessarily need to mean you're moving the next step up the ladder. Um, and with with the way the world has gone uh, and people have now portfolio jobs and portfolio lives and all the rest of it, uh, we find that suits us as much as it suits them. But the beauty about it is once you create that and then you create a culture around it, you then start to get people to want to come and work for you. And, and whenever I'm asked about it, I always say to people, well, look, when I set this up in the first instance, all I wanted to do was create a firm that helped customers and that people enjoyed coming to work for. Mm. That still holds too, true today. We're trying to help people, but I want people to work for us and enjoy working for us. They should turn up with a smile on their face because they want to, not because they're obliged to clock in at some point in, in the day, you know? Great. So let's explore that that culture a, a little bit because I think you you kind of said you know you you thought it was just all about kind of almost being being everybody's mate to start to to, to start with and your wife came in with you know what some people might go that sounds a bit hard nosed you know now we're setting targets and we're having proper appraisals and all those so you know, what tell us about how that actually helped your culture and how you built the culture from there. Human beings like clarity. Yeah, we all need to know where we stand, um, and if you can't tell somebody where they stand, if feel dissatisfied it's quite simple so um if you think someone's done something good you should tell them if you think they've done something bad you should tell them as well that's the harder bit um because otherwise they have no ideas they don't know what the boundaries are the benchmarks are they don't know where the standards lie uh, and having standards in your business is really really important we've now codified everything we've got a full style handbook which runs to about 30 pages if memory serves it's, it's got everything in there that we could possibly uh, wish for. We've got policies and procedures for absolutely everything. The entire business is process mapped. It's one of the crazy things I did three years in, four years in. Okay. I got come in and process map the entire business for us. Um, and that was deliberate because without a good solid process, you can't grow your business. And you won't be able to see where the gaps are and where the holes are. And we identified early on that there were real issues with some of our processes. And work was falling between the cracks. It was not getting handed over seamlessly. And, and we put a stop to that, first of all, with spreadsheets and with documentation. But then as time went by, we realized that the CRM system was the only thing that would really solve that. So that's where we went. And uh, once the CRM's in, we've now got projects set up. We've got shared workspaces. We've got communications. Everything's all in one place. There's no excuse for people saying, well, I didn't know, because yeah. they get notifications on the desktop on a daily basis to tell them, you need to do this. And and in a way, you know, one of the things, one of the struggles that business owners often face is that they're trying to do too many, too many things, which then what you've just described becomes very difficult to do. Because if you you've you've I know it's not quite this simple, but essentially you've got one core service, one core, one core product, which means that you can process map it and you can make it repeatable and teachable to 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 other people. If we were doing 20 
different things that becomes so much harder to to do so that element of focus is also something that strategically is really important to do it's absolutely essential i mean just search engine optimization i mean when i talk to people about it i, I can easily describe it there's only three bits to it you know, there's technical seo there's on page seo and off-site seo so you've got links you've got uh, content and you've got the techie bit that's it that's in a nutshell and that sounds really easy but write those down as tasks there's over 240 of them now yeah. Try to get somebody to repeat that without having a list, without having a process for how you approach them. Which ones do you do first? When do you do them? How do you do them? How much of it do you do? You know, all those things, they're all now built into what we do. And because we've done that, we're able to create products. So we don't actually sell a service anymore. We yeah. productize the service so people can buy a package from us, but it's a defined package. And that helps move them forward. And there's clarity there. There's clarity for the customers. They know what they're paying for and what we should be expected to deliver. So each month when we give them the report, we can say, and here's what we've delivered. So, yeah, it, it works really well. So that comes back to that cultural clarity piece. People yeah. need to know where they stand. So it, that really helps us. And how do you keep then the urgency of, because um, we, we can all get into a rut, can't we, if we do th the same thing too often and that over time you know how do you keep the momentum going within the within the business of people work on the right things well uh, it's quite interesting because um the title of the book is called search never sleeps ah, and it yeah, pretty yeah. much defines where we are as a business it's the hashtag yeah. that we use as well um and search does never sleep i mean literally changes on a daily basis google updates and tweaks the algorithm about four times a day. Uh, it does a half a dozen major updates a year. Um, nothing ever stands still in the, the world of Google. And nothing ever stands still online as well. A, a website that was great yesterday could be rubbish tomorrow just because of one thing that's changed. So keeping on top of that and understanding the changes and figuring out what levers you need to pull to mitigate against that is really, really important. Um, so so uh, there's no chance of, of getting stale because there's always so much more to do. I internally, also, we, we put people together in little groups. So we have little project teams that can go and look at stuff. So, for example, right. uh, AI at the moment is the big buzzword. You know, February of yep. this year, chat GPT, two months, and it's got, you know, hundreds of millions of views, which is great. Fastest adoption of any technology uh, in history ever. Yep. Um, so... How does that affect us? Well, honestly, I, I don't know. At my time of life, it's it's not something I'm used to. Um, but the guys I got working for me, the kids, they're brilliant. They love this kind of stuff. So we've got a group together who are now looking into it and saying, okay, so how does it affect what we're doing? How could it uh, influence what we're doing? Could it streamline some of the processes that we have? Could it help us with that? Uh, you and I were talking just before we came on about pieces of software that will help us record notes in meetings so that mm. you, know, you don't have to do it after the event or take contemporary and use notes with, with your pen so yeah little bits like that can make a massive difference and if that can free up time for us to be more strategic for our customers to actually think about what we're doing a bit more you could be hugely effective great brilliant well i've um yeah I've, i'm really really enjoying what um our conversation here are you are you up for a couple of sort of quick fire questions before we draw to draw to a close and well, it, you know, it sounds like you love what you do what do you what do you what do you love most about what you do i suppose the the bit i love the most is is it's a challenge every day um no no two days are the same um one of, one of the guys in the office actually asked me the other day, he said, do you still get excited by SEO? I said, yeah, I'm awake at six every morning. <laughs> and it sounds weird that I should get excited by something like this, but it's the ultimate problem solving challenge for me because what you're trying to do is solve a problem that somebody has so you can help them. Yeah, It's on a constantly moving board. So how do you do that? Which levers do you need to pull to make this thing work? Uh, and, and, it's problem solving it's it's understanding what the issues are breaking it down and then coming up with a solution that works uh, and, and i just i thoroughly enjoy that process i really do brilliant and what what frustrates you most about the industry that you're in <laughs> there's lots of frustrations as you might expect yeah. uh, ranging from uh, uh how small businesses in this country are treated by the government in terms of their taxation policies but that's a, a different topic which we won't stray into today um down to things like uh, 
customers we've had come to us who've been told things about SEO which are untrue or right. incorrect. Yeah, uh, and I've spent my whole uh, you know career in this going out doing lecture. I do lectures. I do public speaking. Um, all kinds of presentations. And I'll take any questions from anybody. And if I don't know the answer, I will say I don't know the answer. But in most cases, I can give them a very clear steer on what they should know about it, which is what really has been put into this book now to help people, help yeah. more people. Because I can't stand in front of everybody all the time, I suppose. Brilliant. Good. And if you were to go back to your younger self, whether that's when you started the business or maybe before, but you know, what, what, what advice would you, would you give yourself? Be braver. Be braver. Believe in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, yeah. one else will. Yeah. And I wish I could have given, given myself a kicking at about 23, 24 years old and got that into my head. Because if I'd really taken that on board, I'd possibly be in a very different place because I would have moved further and faster and, and probably gone on to do more things. Yeah, if, if only we could all go back to 30 years ago with the knowledge and everything that we've got now. <laughs> well, that, that's where the phrase, you know, youth is wasted on the young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's where it comes from. But but to, to be fair, I, I'm actually, I'm happy, I'm comfortable where I am. And I'm, I'm really happy with what I've managed to achieve in my life, because it is my life. So yeah. I, I've lived it. So, so far, I'm I'm so, so happy with what, what I've managed to achieve. And hopefully along the way, I've helped people. And that's, that's really what it was all about. And that ties in probably to my next question. You mentioned the legacy. You know, what is the legacy that you want to want to leave? The, the legacy of the business really is that, that, that we should be uh, able to help people, not just our customers. But I hope, and I know we are, helping the people who work for us at this moment in time. We're helping shape their careers where we take on apprentices every year and we help shape their futures, if you like. And by giving them a good grounding, by giving them a really nice environment to work in, by giving them uh, some clear guidelines that they can run their life by and by doing all of that kind of stuff, we help them and we give them a great start in life. And I hope and I believe that they'll never forget the start that they had working for Acorns. Excellent. Love that. And in terms you clearly you know you you give the impression certainly that you've read around the area of, of, of business and what what books or podcasts or resources would you recommend to others well i'm going to recommend four books if that's okay i know they yeah. can go, no no sorry so um many years ago i i was put on to uh, two books by an author called john warrillo yeah they come across so the first one i read was built to sell um, and that's about uh, a guy with a, a digital agency who yes. builds and sells it. So it's a great little story. It's a Sam, really isn't it? Is it Sam? I can't remember his name now. It's yeah. been a few years since I read it. But, but <laughs> yes, but some of, some, most of the lessons in there, I, I just took straight to heart and went, wow, brilliant. Yeah. Um, and this isn't because I'm going to sell it, but it's because it's the way to grow your business. It's yeah. the way you can structure it. And then the second book he wrote, which he then said, I wish I'd written this one first, is called The Automatic Customer. Yeah. And it explains all the different revenue recurring models that there are available in the world today. And it will explain everything. It doesn't matter what you sell. There's a way you can monetize it by making a recurring revenue model. Yeah. Brilliant. So those are inspirational. And then for anybody, uh, that's for any business owner anywhere. Just just read those, those two yeah. books and they'll really give you inspiration. Uh, for uh, agency owners, I've, I've just finished, well, in the last four months, uh, two books, which I can recommend. The first one is is by some guys called uh, Agency Nomics. It's a team called Cactus. So, so this book is written by uh, Spencer Gallagher and Pete Hull, and this is called Grow Your Agency to the First Five Million Pounds and Beyond. And in this, they codify a lot of the stuff that um, that John Warrillo has in his books, but specifically applying it to agencies. And they weave into this into there the kind of stuff that I know you've got in your book as well. So it's all that put together in one nice nutshell, but just for agency owners. And then one of the other guys that they work with is a guy called Gareth Healy, and he's written something called Stand Out or Die. All right, yeah, very, very similar principle, uh, but it explains how you should push an agency forward. So I can recommend all of those. Perfect, really good. Thank you very much. Um, and. Any any bits of technology apps? You, know, you you would talk about Otter. You were just you're just starting to get your head around yeah. Otter and use use that. Any other any other bits? Any tools that you'd like to use? 
I, I'm notorious for for being a technophobe. <laughs> uh, terrible, uh, as you can see. Uh, you can see, but the listeners can't. Behind me is my stamp collection. I, I like nothing more than relaxing, putting stamps into albums or writing up postal history covers. Um, and my phone has um, the one top tip I can, can give everybody. My phone's been on silent for the last seven years. Okay. If you want a better life, turn off all notifications and put your phone on silent. I promise you. You'll take a deep breath, you, you'll feel better, and your shoulders will start to drop a bit instead of being tensed up as they are. I know they probably are at the moment. Yeah. Um, if you miss a call, don't worry. We used to miss calls when we didn't have mobile phones. People would just ring back. You know, that's the way of the world. There's nothing so urgent that it can't, you know, wait for five minutes. Great. So that's one of the top tips. But within that, I'm going to give people two tips, and they're not for work apps at all. Okay, so yeah. they're, they're geeky ones. So the first one is for anybody who buys stuff on eBay and is, is being caught out by the auctions. You know, when, when the auction, the last five seconds, suddenly yes. the price shoots up and you go, how did I lose that? Yeah. Uh, the answer is because someone's sniping it from the, from the sidelines. And there's a very, very good sniper app called Gixen, G-I-X-E-N. Um, and the uh, guy who, who built it and runs it, it's called Mario, and he's got a little support uh, column on, online and everything. But but that's a brilliant. It costs about seven dollars a year, something like that. Brilliant. If you ever buy stuff off of eBay, use Gixon because okay. you, you, you'll, you won't lose another auction again. You simply put in your maximum your your wish to ever pay for it, and it snipes it at the last second. And usually you get it way 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 under what you have put in as your maximum bid. So that's a great one. Like it. Um, and the other one I've just got turned on to for some strange reason, um, because it's summer and the birds are singing in the trees. And I quite like a bit of bird watching for relaxation. Uh, there's an app called Merlin. Yes. Yeah. Free to use. And you can uh, press the little button on it and it, does, it says sound ID. And you can hold it up and it will listen to all the sounds of all the birds singing and tell you what's singing. And yeah. there'll be stuff that you don't know and you can't recognise, but it will tell you it's there. So, yeah, I love it. Amazing, that. isn't it? And yeah. that's... And, and they're just little the quirky ones. They're nothing to do with work, but you yeah. all need to take time out from work every every now and again. And these are these are good ways of doing that. Great. And I think that also um, the data from that allows them to track um, the, where, the, the, where the birds are concentrating and, and different types of birds and things like that. So it's a, it does, a nice yeah. spin off to that as well. It, it, is, it is quite good. And it's got a research purpose behind it, which is yeah. wonderful. So, yeah, yeah. So like Lovely. So um, <laughs> obvious question, maybe, maybe not. Maybe your surprise is, you know, what, what what's your most successful marketing tactic? <laughs> well, <laughs> most successful obviously must be search engine optimization right <laughs> except it's not it's not um yeah. because we we get most of our business through uh, referrals and recommendations and networking we do a huge amount of networking um and it's because because there's so many agencies doing what we do because there's so much competition because people have usually been burnt they want to get to know you first before they're willing to spend money um, yeah. so getting to know business owners is really important from our point of view um, and we'll We'll sometimes talk to business owners for four, five, six years before they come on board as customers. Um, and then they stay with us for another five or six years and so on. Mm. So, yeah, so I, I would say that, that that is probably our best way of doing it. But the other bit, which uh, people might be surprised about, is uh, we still send mailers. Okay. We do proper mailers and we send them out in the post um, and we get a good return from those. Um, and I wouldn't have expected it in this day and age, but mm. putting a envelope in the post with the stamp on it and somebody's address on it and their personal name um that often works they, they like the approach well there's something along the the stand out or die idea of the book that you just brought up then is that you know there's not so many people doing that anymore so therefore you're stand you're, you're standing out you're actually yeah you're doing something they're not expecting um, <laughs> and that gets through because post still gets to people's desks would you believe emails get deleted or put in the junk folder yeah, yeah. brilliant well, I've had a fascinating time listening to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much in, indeed. If people would like to get hold of you or find out more about Aquis or indeed reserve your book, what do they need to know? Well, um, so the book will be coming out at the end of June, hopefully. We're still trying to get the time setter to speed up a bit because it's not quite there, but it will be available on Amazon. Uh, so they'll be able to look for that. It's called Search Never Sleeps. 
um, and there'll be a website which is about to go live called search never sleeps so just search for that online um, you can get hold of me as always linkedin is the professional place where everyone sends people to so you can go to linkedin and listen i'd, I'd love to to link in with as many of your listeners who are actually wanting to link in with me more than happy to do so uh, we share top tips of seo uh, on our pages on a regular basis uh, and i kind of share and comment stuff uh, as well um if they want to come to our website it's aqueous-digital.co.uk um, and for anybody out there who thinks actually I, I would like somebody to have a look at the website we do offer a free audit there's a little uh, button if you like on the bottom right hand corner of the screen when you go there it should pop up on your phone as well click that fill the form in and one of the guys will actually do a free audit for you so we're happy to do that that's that's Super. our way of getting back if you like so yes there's plenty of ways to get in touch I'm, I'm on all the other usual channels as well though not as frequently as as linkedin brilliant Jonathan, thank you very much indeed for being my guest on Scale Up Radio today. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. And if you're building and scaling your own business, you might well be interested in our book, The Entrepreneurial Scale Up System. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a practical handbook around scaling a business in a structured way. And you can order a copy on all your favorite online retailers, including an audio version, or you can find it and other supporting resources on our website, www.esusgroup.co.uk. UK. That's esusgroup.co.uk, which is e s u s g r o u p dot co dot uk. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.